AEW, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Forbidden Door. Your boy got the clean sweep. Okay, here's the thing. I don't think this was the hardest show in the world to predict, but there were certainly some matches that turned around and could have gone completely the other way. But welcome to Down Down Up Up. It's your boy here, Apollo. If you saw my prediction video and watched the show, you know I'm on a all-time high right now. I've been doing these predictions for AEW for, um, I guess, a little over a year now. And I've always tried to stay in the ballpark, like maybe two-thirds, around two-thirds, right? But we didn't play that game this time. We hit the home run. We pointed all the way up to the cheap seats. And we hit that ball so hard that it went flying out of the ballpark. It's time to review Forbidden Door. It's time for me to gloat and enjoy this moment as a wrestling fan to know not only did I get what I wanted, I predicted it, and I enjoyed it. Let's try to run this down. Forbidden Door. Okay. We certainly had a few matches added. A few things changed, but that does not change my opinion of anything for the moment. We're going to do our best. Starting with the buy-in. Nice thing is, we had three matches on the buy-in again. I really like that. I don't really want to tune into a buy-in and just see promo after promo. I want more than one match. And we did that here. We had Bishamon, I believe the team of Yoshihashi, and Hiroki Goto. I was disappointed that I had forgotten who was in this match because Goto's great. I forgot how cool freaking Goto was to see. First time I saw him, he beat Jushin Thunder Liger. That's how cool he is, damn it. Uh, beating the Factory's uh, Aaron Solo and QT Marshall. And this was expected. It was stressing me out a little bit when the Factory got, uh, I believe Solo and uh, Marshall got a few combination moves in and then the cutter. But terrible defense. Thankfully, um, Bishamon were able to turn it around and get the win. And it was a good start for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Even though... I feel like if there's going to be any biased negativity toward this show, it might be the lack of wins for New Japan, but maybe I'm skipping the gun. But anyway, good start. And then a little bonus match. Um, Nick Camarado from the factory again, taking on Lance Archer. And um, yeah, surprise match. Obviously, I picked Archer, because otherwise I wouldn't be on the all-time high right now. I figured this would just be a nice little two-minute match, but uh, it made Camarado look a little bit good. But then, of course, Archer squashed him, because it's Archer, and it was nice to see him get a little bit of a spotlight with his New Japan Pro Wrestling roots. He is, of course, a former United States champion in that organization multiple times. Hell, he beat Moxley on a dynamite for that championship, if you guys remember that. I think that was the Texas Death Match a while ago. And then we get to the third that I actually didn't know was on the buy-in. For some reason, I thought this one that, uh, was on the main card, but it paid off. Um, uh, Swerve uh, in Our Glory, I think is our team name. Keith Lee and uh, Swerve Strickland defeating, um, oh, bless, uh, El Desperado. I can't remember the name of the other one. Yosh, Yoshinobu, I think, is his first name, but... This was good. It furthered the storyline of uh, Swerve and Keith can't stay on the same page. Uh, Swerve was accidentally kicking the crap out of Keith on several occasions and regretting it every single time, of course. And, of course, it allowed the heels to get in control. Uh, the other one had a habit of uh, spitting whiskey in the face and got Keith. And, oh, my gosh, that roll-up afterwards, that was going to steam the heck out of me. I don't want to see Keith Lee lose like that. But, no, we're kicking out. We're getting the Big Bang Catastrophe. And one, two, three, Swerve and Keith are back on the same page enough to get a win. But I'm not sure how long they're going to last still as a team. But I didn't think they'd be taking taking this L, and that paid off enough. Um, actually, I apologize. Did I say three matches? I meant four matches for the buy-in, because, yes, we did go overload. We topped Revolution. Um, because, yes, I don't think the Keith Lee tag match was supposed to be on the buy-in, and, uh, of course, Archer and Camarado just got added, I guess, last day, last minute, etc. We then got to the main event of the buy-in, and that, of course, was... Uh, Japanese young boys taking on um, Max Caster, Billy Gunn, and the Ass Boys. Although, here's the thing. 
I almost got screwed out of this pick because right before the match started, Danhausen shows up on the Tron and offers a gift to the ass boys and he plays this ridiculous tune that ticked them off and away they went. Both of them ran to the back to see what the heck was going on. So it was a four on two. Thankfully, Billy Gunn and Caster turned it around great. And Famouser, big elbow from Caster, one, two, three, a lovely win for the acclaimed and Billy Gunn. That is all I'm going to say. A very funny choice for this match. A strange one, but amusing nonetheless. The acclaimed lose enough on TV. I don't want to see them lose on the buy-in. And they didn't. So that's what I call content. Now we get into proper show. So at this point... Even my uh, buy-in predictions felt like, ooh, we just snuck by that. How are we going to be doing with the actual show? Well, we started with the big six-man tag. Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, the Sex Gods, and Minoru Suzuki taking on Eddie Kingston, Wheeler, Yuta. And I apologize, the name of the other one escapes me once again. But he was good. It was a very entertaining match. And, ooh, if you had to honestly ask me, this was probably in my top three of the evening. Um, I very much enjoyed it, and the teasing was very well done for this match. And of course, one thing I didn't know when I predicted this was that the advantage uh, towards Blood and Guts was on the line in this match. Hence, the winning team would get the first member in Blood and Guts. I felt much better knowing that after my prediction of Jericho, Sammy, and Minoru Suzuki. And of course, after the struggle, they did win. The Japanese bloke on Kingston and Yuta's team got a little bit too carried away when he was taking his one-on-three medicine. He was able to take care of Guevara and Suzuki, but a little bit of distracting dancing and Judas Effect, one, two, three, Jericho and company picking up the win. And I know what I said in my prediction video. I wasn't going to count this pay-per-view uh, toward my Jericho pay-per-view streak of calling everything perfect for him. I lied. I'm going to take full credit and put this one on the train. I just don't care. That's how happy I was about it. I probably would have counted it anyway if I knew that the advantage to Blood and Guts was on the line anyway. Sorry, I don't know why it froze for a second. I saw uh, a freeze, but hopefully we're all good now. Anyway, uh, moving on. Then, then we got scared. Or at least I got scared because I can't believe the triple threat winner take all tag team championship match was second. Second on the card. FTR, Jeff Cobb and the great Ocon, and Rapungi Vice. Whew, this, this I thought was gonna be match of the night. And it very well could have been if. Yep. Yeah, I don't know what happened to Dark Dax Harwood. I haven't looked into the backstory and aftermath of this show like probably uh, many of you have. But something happened to Dax's shoulder early on. I'm not sure if he dislocated it or popped it or something. But he was struggling. He had to tag out and he had to leave. That's right. Dax left in maybe the first five minutes of this match, I think. And that, that was like a low blow right to the gut. Like, that's like I got punched and then punched again while I was down, crying about the first punch. Cash was on his own, and it looked like Cobb and Ocon were taking it. They were taking the abuse from Rapungi Vice, but Rapungi Vice couldn't get any special kind of offense that made me think they had this in the bag. And Cobb and Ocon were putting in the work, and I was just... Thinking when, when, when is Cobb going to be hitting that tour of the islands? But the miracle of miracles. <sighs> Dax came back. FTR were able to get themselves together. And oh man, when you saw the positioning that Romero was in, you knew it was going to happen. Cobb and Ocon were down. Trent was down. The big rig shatter machine and one, two, three, FTR win the freaking gold. This was one of the best emotional moments of the whole show. Now, honestly, I'd love to think that Dax's injury was planned and coming back to get the emotional pop works so well, but I just don't think FTR are the blokes to do that sort of thing because it's all about the tag team wrestling. That's what we're here for. So, it's a shame to ruin the quality of the match in that sense, but I believe it was real. Things happen. Don't try this at home. You know people get hurt, especially lately. You guys know the injury bug going around lately. It's terrible right now, but FTR winning felt so good. I don't think 
I was on that emotional level of anything until Zack Sabre Jr.'s match, but we'll get into that. Oh my goodness, we'll get into that. But FTR, AAA Tag Team Champions. Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions. IWGP Tag Team Champions. You love to see it. Moving on. This, without a doubt, is probably where I just knew I had this in the bag. And when I, I apologize. I actually just talked about emotional moments uh, waiting for the next one. I was wrong. It was actually the next match that did it for me. I can't believe this escaped my mind. This was the call of the night for me, without a doubt. The All-Atlantic Championship match. So, Clark Connors. Nice to see him. And he actually made uh, some good moves to look more like a star in this match. He made up for Ishii not being here, and he made the most out of it, getting his uh, clarification. Miro, Black, Malachi Black, and the winner, after a crazy good match, the bastard Pac. It was so good to see Pac get his moment in AEW. I felt confident, but still a little bit nervous picking him. You just gotta give people their due. AEW is a company that will do that. And it happened. It happened. Miro took the table spot, but he got back up, and that was really starting to worry me. He was doing all the right things. But then Black comes in with the mist. Oh, wait just a second. Black Mass. But Connors ruined any chance of Malachi trying to pin Miro. Miro was out after that. And I knew what was happening once I saw Black just going for some kind of triangle choke or arm bar, arm breaker on Connors. Where is Pac going? He did not quite hit the Black Arrow, a beautiful 450, but then right into the rings of Saturn on Connors, an instant tap out. Oh, this could have gone so many different ways, but it didn't. Pac is champion. And it is, again, well-deserved. He's gone a long way from the big moments early in AEW. Because let's be honest. Remember when Pac was, like, really showing up? He beat Kenny Omega clean. Clean. And all out, I believe, in 2019. He was the star. Honest to God. And then the pandemic happened. And it took a lot out of the momentum train. He was able to hold his own with Death Triangle and staying relevant and whatnot. But let's be honest, Death Triangle has one of the worst injury bug bites in all wrestling groups right now. <sighs> now, now he's champion. It feels really good to say. Great job, Pac. And then we move on to some more uncharted territory, especially when it got turned into a six-man tag. We had Dudes with Attitudes, which, of course, was Darby Allen Sting, and I believe nicknamed the Dragon. I can't remember the man they teamed with. Taking on the Young Bucks, and love to see El Fantasmo back. Very fun to see him back. Entrances, too, were fantastic. Uh, the baby faces came out first, but Sting, for some reason, didn't come out, and I was a bit worried at that point. I'm thinking, is he attack? Then the Young Bucks come out. It's the usual super kick nonsense with their um, theme, but then it turns into the Bullet Club theme. That was great, but then the lights go out, and Sting jumps off the damn rafters. He jumps off the entrance, Tron, right into them. It was amazing. I'm like, oh my goodness, he's already doing this? What are we doing later? Turns out there wasn't anything crazy like a big table spot or something for him to do in this match, but that that was ridiculous. Sting doesn't stop. Then the actual match happened, and yeah, it was good. The Bucks put in the work like you expect. Of course, new AEW Tag Team Champions going to work. But somehow, somehow Sting was able to take the punishment. He put the Bucks down with the Scorpion Death Drops, both at the same time. And then the Dragon was actually able to put El Phantasmo away. It was a little bit awkward when you realize that the baby faces had it, but it didn't end right away. The finish was a bit wonky, but hey, there you go. Sting remains, I believe, still undefeated in AEW. And if anything, this might lead to Darby and Sting finally getting a tag team championship match. But it was a fun time, enjoyable, and it kept things going. Loved it. And then I really don't want to say it, Ah, yes. Don't want to say it. The women's championship match. Thunder Rosa, Tony Storm. I don't know what it is lately. Women's championship matches on pay-per-view are just becoming more and more anticlimactic. I'm not talking about the results. I'm not talking about the wrestling. It's just the finish is just 
so strange and it lets the air out of the room too quickly. I was a little bit excited for this match and already in the early going it had me. And then Thunder just turned up the control switch. I don't know. She got the Thunder Driver and Tony kicked down the thing. Okay, good. It can't be over yet, but damn, that had me for a second. And then she hits the final cut, basically uh, Dustin Rhodes' finisher, and pins her. Thunder Rosa is still the women's champion, but is it just me? Tony Storm got left out to dry, almost squashed in the end going there. It was a choice. It was a choice. And I'm not really sure if that paid off too much. It was the only women's match on the card, and it felt like a disappointment for it to end the way it did. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but that's my opinion out there with the women's match for this show. But the one good thing that I hate to refer to the women's match is that it gave me time to get some adrenaline back. Because after that, it was Will Ospreay and Orange Cassidy for the United States Championship. This was fun. This was fun, fun, fun. I got no complaints with this match. The false finishes were ridiculous. The kick out Osprey got on the beach break. I thought that was it. It's one of it's just one of those special kickouts that not too many people can get in wrestling. Lesnar has had them. Kurt Angle has had them. Will Osprey had one, and man, it was great. But of course, had to turn it around. The big elbow, and I hate to say it, I missed it. I missed the Stormbreaker because we were having problems with the show at that point. But Osprey retained. They had a little kerfuffle with Rapongi Vice and Cassidy after the match. Osprey did have Ozzy open with him uh, for this one. And then, uh, oh, I forget his name already, but a big uh, New Japan name, obviously, uh, came out to make the save, had a little fun with Orange Cassidy. The crowd did pop, so that must have been a good moment for the New Japan fans, without a doubt. So fair play to that. We got our big moment, uh, like literally right after, I'm pretty sure. That Sabre Jr. came out. And we didn't waste time building to who it was. Because once he came in the ring and the music stopped, cut to the crowd, cut to some music, crowd's going nuts. Out comes Claudio. Cesaro, Swiss, is all elite. I I felt so good seeing him come out. It, it was such a long time coming for Swiss to get this moment. If you have been a fan with him in WWE, that is one thing. If you have been a fan of him outside of the ring on YouTube with Tyler Breeze, Austin Creed, and Adam Cole, that is a different thing. I have those two emotional caps flying out of me once he came out and smiled. It was amazing. The match itself, unfreaking believable how amazingly technical it was and how it almost didn't even happen. Bell ring, Swiss immediately running uppercut, neutralizer. I was ready for that to be it because honestly, I don't think you could have ruined anything with that crowd. But Sabre Jr. kicked out, so the neutralizer is not as big a deal that I believe it should be. I like the finisher, but we're going to put that on hold. They had a lovely match. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. If there was one downer, I was honestly ready for a swing of up to 50. That is something I was definitely ready for. And yes, we got things later. I'm not going to criticize too much. But Swiss went to some old roots. The double arm uh, hooking power bomb did the trick. Cesaro beats Zack Sabre Jr. And we loved every little bit of it. Claudio is all Elite, he is going to Blood and Guts Wednesday. Oh, it was great to see. It was great to see. There were other names floating around for who it could be, but uh, Claudio made the most sense. Made the most sense. And uh, the only aftermath of the show I really watched was him and Khan talking to the press, and he just sounded so happy to be there. He, he Like he said, he's a kid in the candy store. Ready to go. Now, two matches to go. This is where, I, I don't want to say it, I don't want to say it, this is where I lost uh, the adrenaline, the fatigue came in, and um, the predictability may have uh, ruined it for some, it didn't really ruin it for me, I, I was just ready for what happened, because I was on the high at that point of calling the show perfect. Fatal four-way match for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, Jay White, Adam Cole, 
Hangman Adam Page, and uh, Kazuchika Okada, who thankfully didn't win. This was okay. Honestly, I can't give it too much else, uh, and I'm not really talking about the finish. The match itself was just kind of okay for me. It may have not helped that I already experienced a fatal four-way match earlier with Pac, and then this came in so late. It was okay. That's all I have. And I know we now have to talk about that after some decent enough false finishes, but nothing too crazy. We got the finish. Uh, Adam Cole had been dodging the Rainmaker like crazy, and he dodged it again. Jay White was able to come in and get a Blade Runner on Okada. And then Cole was down, and then Jay White just dragged him over and pinned him, even though it looked like Cole tried to kick out. It was very underwhelming, but from what I've heard, Adam Cole is hurt. I just don't know when it happened during the match. I, I I can't give any more than that. I hope he's okay because it's Adam Cole, baby. He's great. Love him. Chugs, baby. Bonehead. But I didn't know that um, after the match. So immediately I just started making uh, uh, the party jokes. You chugs it up. You made a bonehead play and I couldn't help it. I really hope he's okay and it's not too serious. I did believe I heard the announcer say he was able to walk away uh, on his own will after the match, so let's hope he's okay. But Jay White retaining the championship obviously is the decision that made all the sense in the world. Ha it happened. Let's just go with that for now. Then the main event. Moxley, Tanahashi. This was okay. Again, I wasn't excited for this match to begin with, and Tanahashi really doesn't do it much for me. I am surprised that Mox decided to blade and just go blood for this one. <laughs> Um, because we have Blood and Guts coming up Wednesday. But it was what you expected. Finally, the paradigm shift. One, two, three. Moxley is the new AEW interim champion. Two times. Love to see it. I'm happy to see him with the belt. And if he is saved for Punk, then great. I, If you remember uh, my discussion, I believe it was all out last year. I wanted Punk and Mox to move into a program quicker. If this leads to that and I get what I want, then I will certainly enjoy that. Otherwise, I'm not sure if I'm crazy about Moxley holding the championship for too, too long. There's just other names in AEW I'm interested in holding it right now. And then, of course, we had the brawl at the end. A lot of people were wondering what the end was going to be. Some people, including myself, thought maybe Kenny Omega's going to come out and just, you know, show himself again. But no, we had the build-up to Blood and Guts. Out came Jericho Appreciation Society. And, of course, um... Santana and Ortiz, Eddie Kingston, Wheeler, Yuta, trying to make this look like a fair fight. And then, of course, Claudio comes out. He makes the save. Swing, swing, swing. And the good guys reign supreme. That was Forbidden Door. It was a very fun show, but even more fun because I just called it. And I love gloating about moments like this. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for enjoying the results and reviews. I look forward to seeing you guys uh, maybe Saturday or Friday, it depends, uh, for my Money in the Bank predictions, because we're not slowing down, we got Blood and Guts Wednesday, and we got Money in the Bank Saturday, wrestling, am I right? Have a good day, everyone, perfect predictions for Forbidden Door, keep it real.